How's it going, Heights Church? Uh, it's exciting to be together with you today. And um, if you have been following, we are in a series called Dare to Pray. And I don't know about you, but I have been challenged to pray deeper. I have been challenged to pray differently with boldness and courage. And it has really help me kind of navigate this time. And so my hope and my prayer is that you also have found a deeper faith because you have dared to pray. Now we have a local community, or not community, a local college, William Jessup University, and their theme this year is abundance. Now that theme abundance for them comes from a passage we find in the gospel of John chapter 10. And it's this idea that Jesus came to give you life abundant. So this word abundance is something that I've just been kind of working through. And today I want to share with you some of the powerful truths in that passage of John 10.10. 10. There is truths, there is promises that I think can have huge, huge implications in your life and in my life. And so I don't want to waste any more of your time. I want to jump right in. And so let's read that passage in John 10, 10. This is Jesus speaking, and this is what he says. The thief, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came, Jesus says, I came that you that they may have life and have it abundantly. Have it abundantly. Now, we could go on and on. We could be here all day. We could do a whole series on what that means for your life and for my life, the implications that it could have in the lives of everyone in the world. But today, we don't have that time. And so I just want to point out a couple of things that just, to me, have been resonating. And I've been kind of partnering it and putting it together with our theme, Dare to Pray. And so I want to share with you my thoughts. First is this. Did you notice, did you notice in that passage, the thief's only purpose, right? We can't miss that. His only purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. The, his only absolute one reason for his presence, his purpose, and, and position is to bring destruction, not to bring anything that's of any worth, not to bring anything that's any have any value or any good into your life. He only wants to kill and destroy and to steal. He steals life. He destroys life. He takes life. And he has absolutely no other purpose. But here's another thing I know about the thief. That thief, he, his visits in your life, his visits in my life are for his own selfish purposes. He doesn't come with your best interest nor my best interest in mind. His visits are only for his own selfish purposes. He doesn't have you in mind. He doesn't even really care about you. He only cares about what he can take from you what he can kill in your life. He comes to destroy who you are and what you have. He comes ultimately to kill anything of value in your life. I also know that that thief is sneaky. He very rarely knocks on the front door. He very rarely makes his, announces his presence in your life. He sneaks in. He slides into our lives unannounced, unwelcome, but nonetheless, there he is. But check this out. I love the fact that Jesus speaks this powerful truth about himself. He says this, I came that they may have life, and have it abundantly. You see, the thief wants to take life. Jesus, I have come to give you life. And I don't want to just give you life. I want to give it abundantly in your life. I want you to experience abundance in your life. See, the thief kills. And this whole idea is in the context of the shepherds and the sheep. And, and he, you know, we know that the thief, right, will come in the middle of the night to steal and kill and destroy, to take those sheep away. We know that the shepherd will try to do his very best to protect the sheep. But Jesus is the good 
shepherd. He says, I I I didn't come just to protect you. I came to give you life. And Jesus is the only one that say, I have come to give you life abundantly. He's the only one who can make that claim and deliver. The thief will tell you lies. The The thief will make you believe that this is what you need. But remember, he's only coming to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life. So let me, let me explain this to you. So in one hand, right? In one hand, you have life, right? You have life. And that's just, you know, your day to day. You wake up, you go to work, you go to sleep. You wake up, you do, and then you sleep. You come, you sit, you go. And that's life. And that's all there is. It's just kind of the bare essentials, the bare things that you need in life. But Jesus, I have come that you may have life abundantly. You may have life abundantly. Now think about this, this life abundant. You know those times, maybe you've been, you've been a part of something that just makes your heart sing. Maybe for you, it's maybe being outdoors. Maybe for you, it's being with family. Maybe for you, it's serving or sharing or some kind of sports activity or there's something that just makes your heart sing. And you may have said this phrase, man, this is living. Or better yet, maybe you said, and I know I have said this many a times, it just doesn't get any better than this. It's like this huge excitement step up from just life, but you are experiencing abundant life. It is that sweet spot that you love. It just doesn't get any better. Have you ever had those? It just doesn't get any better than this moment. I'm sure you have. We all have. So we have life, wake, to do, to sleep. But then there are moments we could just say, it doesn't get any better than this. But I think it's even more than that. Jesus came to give us life, not just complete with the bare essentials, but he came so that we may have this rare, miraculous life to be rich and to be full. Not just to go through the steps, but to be rich and full, to live into the miraculous that is available to us, to live into that authority that we sang about, to live into that freedom not just to exist, but to have abundant life, to have this life that is full of abundant living. That you and I would not merely have the life of simple and bare, but we would have all those rare, miraculous things which are needed to make this life eminently more blessed and rich. They would be full of his vast mercy and grace which keeps us from just existence that brings in so much more. Jesus gives this eternal joy and peace in the midst of storms. Abundant living is this. It is a way of life where you and God are interacting in step with one another. He is in every movement, every decision, You are intertwined together. The Bible refers this to as walking in the spirit. That is the abundant life that Jesus offers. That you could walk at the side in step with Jesus, intertwined, intermeshed, interacting in an intimate relationship, not religion, but relationship with him. That's the abundant living. And can I give you a bit of good news today? That abundant life that Jesus said he came to give is available to you and available to me today. It can start today. It doesn't matter where you have been. It doesn't matter what you have done. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and and have it abundant. It's available. That's the good news but we must always remember the thief. And if we're not watching and we're not prepared, he will make an entrance. You see, when I was in my early 20s, I felt this call to ministry. I felt this call on my life. And it was affirmed by my senior pastor at the time. It was affirmed by some elders in my life. And I'll be honest, that call scared me a bit. And so I began to 
pull back in my relationship with God. I, I began to kind of move in my life. And I decided in that moment to decide for myself what is good. Not leaning in, not walking in step, not walking in the spirit with my Lord. I decided to make those decisions and what was good for me myself. And I'll tell you what, I went from one mistake to the next mistake to the next mistake. I listened to the lies and to the messages of the enemy of this world, right? That said, you're no good. And that world and those lies and that enemy, remember, can care less about me. But I bought into it. And I wandered and I lived in that, listen, for two years of my life. Going from one mistake to the next to the next. The calling that I once heard loud and clear from God became a whisper. I couldn't even hear it anymore because of the noise that I had created in my life. I couldn't hear it any longer. I had drowned it out. Have you been there? Have you been there? Have you ever listened to the lies and surrendered to the ways of the world, the pull of the world? Has the colors that were once vibrant in your, for your dreams in your life become faded? Has the call of the Lord in your life, the once loud, clear call, become a whisper in your life? I've been there. I know that spot. I know that dilemma. I know where you may find yourself. I know that wrestling match. Now for others, maybe that dark area, maybe that darkness could possibly come from an addiction, maybe from a hurt or some abuse. Someone somewhere like the thief showed up unexpectedly and they killed that dream that you had. They stole from you your self-confidence. They taken, taken from you your self-esteem. Whatever it may be, they killed the dream that once was inside of you. I am here to tell you that Jesus has come to give you life and give it abundantly. He doesn't mean for you to stay there. He doesn't mean for you to live there. Though that place is very real. That place where you find yourself, maybe you're thinking, I didn't ever expect my life to be here. What hope is there? The hope is I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That's the promise. That's what Jesus offers. You know, last week, Craig was speaking uh, uh, last week, and he had talked about how Elijah was in the cave, and, uh, and, and, and he was standing there, and, and the wind came, and, and God was not in the wind. God was not in the huge earthquake. He wasn't in the big fire either. You see, Elijah had to retune his ear to hear God's voice. He had to retune. You and I, we need to tune our ears into God's voice so that we can understand and grab and take hold of the very promise that Jesus said, I've come to give you life and I've come to give it to you in abundance. We have to retune our ears to God's voice because you know what? It's not in the dog and pony show. It's not in the gift wrapped up like it looks like on Christmas morning. It's in the voice of God speaking into your life as we tune into him. It's not in what this world offers because this world will tell you this is what you need. And God is saying, I am all you need. That's what he's saying. We have to retune our ears. Jesus says, I want to give you life abundant. And he brings dead things to life. He brings freedom to those who are held captive by the enemy. I am living proof of that. The enemy held me captive for two years, wandering from one mistake to the next. But then Jesus met me there. So where do we begin? Well, I want to share with you a story. Now that verse comes in John chapter 10. Now, if you just continue on to John chapter 11, it's part of this big story. And I want to share with you this incredible story found in the gospel of, of John verse 11. Now, it's an amazing story where Jesus walks into a village, right? And he brings life to that which was once dead. You may have heard of it. It's the story of Lazarus. You may have heard of it. 
So let me begin. The moment is recorded in the gospel and in, he basically Jesus is uh, on the outskirts of the village and he hears that his good friend is sick and dying, is gonna die. And then he eventually goes in and he raises Lazarus up from the dead. Now it's a pretty lengthy part in the book and I don't have time to unpack it all, but I do want to let you know that it is packed with good things. And I want you, I, want, I feel like there's some things that you and I can learn and use to help us walk into and live into this abundant life. And it's this. In verse four of chapter 11, it says this, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. We need to, look, will not end in death. Here's what I want you to see. That obstacle, that life situation that you find yourself in, whatever it is that you are just, that's holding you back, wherever that is, I want you to start seeing it as not this place where you have to park it and camp and live, but it's a setback. It's a setback because your setbacks, our setbacks can become our comebacks. Whatever it is that's holding you up, whatever the enemy has you believing, whatever has happened to you, man, I want here to tell you that that setback can become your comeback. And when we start to see it that way, we start to frame it that way, there's literally nothing you can't do as you walk at the side of Jesus. These are merely things that are behind me, not in front of me any longer. And we can then start to moving towards righteous living, that abundant life. Jesus said, look, he's not dead, right? This is not fatal. This is a setback and it's not fatal. All too many times we feel like our setbacks, our valleys, these obstacles, these situations, we go, they're fatal. We treat them as if it's over. We look at a place to where we bury those hopes and we bury those dreams and we say, you know what? I'm just going to finish this out. I, you know, those are here. I've made these mistakes and I'm going to bury all my hopes, all my dreams, the calling that God has on my life. I'm just going to bury it because I've made too many mistakes. I've, the enemy has stolen way too much and there's nothing I can do about it. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly doesn't sound like Jesus' intent for you is to bury your hopes and your dreams and your calling and your commitments in the ground because there's been a setback. Because he says your setback is gonna be your comeback. Verse six, he says this, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. I love this part. You know what? Jesus heard that one of his best friends was sick and dying. He did not panic. He goes, no, no, this is not gonna end in death. He did not panic. He knew the power of the Holy Spirit, which, which was in him. He knew that this was just gonna be a setback, which will be actually Lazarus' comeback. And he did not panic. So many times we panic when something goes wrong or doesn't go according to plan. We freak out about it and we panic, don't run off. Don't live in defeat because there's been a setback to your dream. Don't sign off. Your setback is your comeback. Remember, Jesus waited, and when the time was right, said, let's go. Look, there may be a long period of time from when maybe things in your life didn't go the way as planned. Maybe you're in the midst of it. I don't know. Whatever time gap that is, it could be years, it could be days. Look, the time is now. Don't let that setback, don't let that thing become what something, a place where you bury it and go, yeah, I remember those days. No, let it be the moment you plant your feet and you begin to move towards a comeback. Because Jesus came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus waited and then said, hey, all right, guys, let's boogie, let's go. And then they headed out. 
Verse six, the second part, it says this in six. It's time that I go awaken him. Jesus says, it's time that I go awaken him. I love that, awaken. Listen, when you know Jesus, your dreams, your calling, your freedom from the hurt and pain, listen, it isn't, doesn't have to be your burial plot. If God has declared the promise, he has called you to it. I think he just might be saying, maybe you just may need to see it as this. It's just falling asleep and Jesus needs to wake it up again because that's why he came. We tend to bury those things and say, it's over. Jesus, I am coming to awaken those things. That's why he came. They're not dead. Maybe they're just sleeping or dormant in your life. Maybe you have put them on a back shelf and they're full of dust and you had no intention on ever looking at them again, but you keep looking and going, man, that is what God had for me. That is what God has for me. And Jesus is saying, I am coming to waken that up in you. I am come to raise it up. When I believed the lies of the world, when I was going through that period in my life, when I was stuck behind the obstacles because I had made bad decisions in my life, my calling didn't die. God's purpose and plan for my life wasn't gone. You see, Jesus met me in that moment. He says, I have come to waken it up. And when I was at the end of myself, God brought it back to life. When I, stopped, when I stopped fighting, when I stopped making decisions on what was good for me and started looking for Jesus to give me directions, he brought it back to life. You see, the enemy tried to kill it, but Jesus says, oh, no, no, no. I came so that Tim could have life and have it abundantly. I don't need to live in the lies. I don't need to live in the guilt and the shame. I've come and I'm gonna awaken it up. I'll tell you what, it's been a crazy ride. God has been good. I've experienced his favor. Now that doesn't mean I haven't had times where that enemy creeps back in unannounced. Trust me, he's always lurking to find a way to kill and destroy and to steal something from me and from you. But here's the thing, in that moment, I realized something. Listen, <laughs> For there to be a resurrection, there has to be a death. And that death in my life, maybe it is in your life, was my pride, right? It was my selfishness. Maybe for some it's a guilt and a shame, but some of those things that need to die in your life, we need to stop holding on to being right and start to embrace a surrendered life to Jesus. Because being right and wanting to win wins you nothing. There will be nothing. You will just have bare, essential life. You won't ever experience abundant life. So for there to be a resurrection in your life, for Jesus to bring it back to you, have got to just put it all down and say, uh-uh, there needs to be a death to my pride and my, my selfishness or the guilt or the shame or whatever it is. You fill in the blank. Your setback can become your comeback. And when you walk in step with Jesus, that abundant life, intertwined, intermixed, in step, walking in the spirit, your setbacks are not fatal. They're just a blip on the radar because your comeback is about to happen. Don't panic. So let's take our next step towards this abundant living. As we look back at the story of Lazarus, this is where, for me, this is where it starts to get super exciting. And I don't know about you, but when I read a passage in scripture, and maybe it's just because I'm visual, I always am trying to play it out like a movie, right? Like I'm, I'm playing it out like I'm watching it on screen or that I'm in this crowd there live watching it go down. And so when I read this story, this is, this is one of the top dogs for me. This is amazing. So let me read to you. Now, Jesus, right, had just heard his friend was sick and dying. He said, look, it's not going to be fatal, right? 
Something really cool is about to happen. Let's go wake him up. I'm going to go wake this up, right? And here's where, now we pick this up in verse 38. Then Jesus, with intense emotions, came to the tomb, a cave with a stone placed over its entrance. Verse 39, Jesus told them, roll away the stone, right? Here's the scene. Jesus is walking up and he sees where Lazarus has been born. There was a cave and this big stone placed in the, in the front so you can't get in or out, big stone. And he stands in front of it and he's like, roll that stone away. I love that. He probably said it way cooler than that, but it's okay. Jesus is like, listen, move that stone. So here is my question to you. What is in your way? What's getting in the way? What's the obstacle? What is that setback? You need to identify it. In the power of the Holy Spirit, tell it to roll it away. God, I don't want it anymore. I don't need it anymore. Roll this stone away. But the first step for you and I is to identify what that is. And I don't know what that is for you. For me, it was, I had to just roll the stone away of thinking that I can make the best choices for my life out of step with Jesus. That my way was right. That the world's way, what they were offering, was exactly what I thought I needed. And I need to say, Jesus, you need to roll that lie away. You need to roll that stone in my life away. I need to identify it, that I was selfish, that I had pride, I thought I had this whole thing figured out and I didn't, and I didn't. But when I asked Jesus to roll that stone away, that setback became my comeback. So what is your stone? What's keeping you from the freedom, the calling and the abundant life that Jesus is offering? There's this verse in Hebrews and it says this, let us strip away every weight that hinders us. Let us strip away every weight. And it's this in the idea, in the vain thought of a running a race. You and I, if it's obvious, I am not a runner, right? I'm not even a sprinter. I am a, a stroll, right? But if I was a runner, I am not going to put on ankle weights. I am not going to put on restrictive clothing. I'm not going to have my best time. I'm not going to be the best runner I possibly can. No, we will take off those things that are going to hinder us from moving forward, being proficient, being the best that we can. And these things don't necessarily need to be sin habits. They can be attitudes. They can be the way we treat people. They could be allowing something else to have the priority in our life that God rightfully deserves. All of those things played a part in my life. And I had to identify it. And I had to roll it away. I had to strip that weight off because it was hindering me. It was a huge setback. It wasn't allowing me to move forward. It prevented me from moving into my calling. It could be preventing you from being, being the husband or the father you need to be, or the wife or the mother that you need to be, or the son or the daughter. Whatever it is, you need to identify it and ask God to roll it away, take it from me. So what's keeping you from a good marriage? What's keeping you from being the good husband or wife? What's keeping you from reclaiming your family as a mother or a father? What's keeping you from finding freedom from that hurt and that pain that you carry each and every day? What's keeping you from freedom? What is keeping you from walking in step with God in abundant living? And the list can go on and on and on. Why? Because our excuses go on and on and on. I think about my own excuses. I, man, I, I'm amazed at some of the excuses I make and I believe them. And when those excuses are in contradiction to how God is calling me to live my life, calling me to be a husband or a father or a friend, listen, that is the enemy's lies. That is that enemy sneaking in, unwelcomed, unannounced, but nonetheless there. What is keeping you from those things? 
me move it on. Here's what Jesus says. It says, but or this is what they say to Jesus, rather. They, the people, they come to Jesus. Martha, the, the sister of Lazarus, comes to Jesus and says this, but Lord, it's been four days since he's died. By now, his body is already decomposing. Has anyone ever said to you, you already lost your chance? It's over. I mean, you, you took a shot, you missed. Has anybody ever said that to you? You're too late. You'll never be as effective as you once had been, that you stink at whatever it is that you're doing. You missed your opportunity. And you just accept your new reality and live in it. Just move on. Has anybody ever said that to you? Yeah, me too. I've heard those same words. I've heard those from the enemy. And I've heard those from people. I've told myself those things. But Jesus says this word, believe. For, verse 40, Jesus looked at her and said, didn't I tell you that if you be will believe in me, you will see God unveil his power. Jesus, believe. He said, believe. You see, we need to believe that Jesus is bigger than our obstacle, bigger than the hurt. He's bigger than the addiction. He's bigger than the lies that you believed in. He can bring life to that which was once dead. If we believe, Jesus says, believe. Didn't I tell you? Believe. And then Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. <laughs> Again, he's standing there. Roll that stone away. Lazarus, come out. And then it's exactly what happened in front of all those people, right? That old, dead, stinking Lazarus come walking right out of that grave. He brings back to life that which was once dead. So when Jesus says, move, when Jesus gives you clear direction, move. When that setback starts to become your comeback, listen, when he says, move, move. Roll that stone away. I don't want it. I'm going to believe in the power of Jesus to do a miracle in my life. And Jesus wants you to start making moves. He wants you to start moving forward. Come as you are. Grave clothes included. Walk like a zombie. I don't care. But when Jesus says move, you begin to put one foot in front of the other. And as you take every step towards Jesus, he will bring life to that which was once dead in your life, just like he did Lazarus. Wrapped up, didn't matter. And guess what? It will begin to unravel itself as you walk towards Jesus. Jesus did not call Lazarus to an ordinary life. He woke him from the dead so that he would live an abundant life, an extraordinary life. Jesus came to rescue you from the ordinary life so that you may have abundance. Jesus isn't calling you to ordinary. He's calling you to extraordinary. He's called you to an abundant life, an abundant marriage, be an abundant husband or wife, mother or father. He's calling you to be a, a, an abundant son or daughter. He's calling you to be an abundant co-worker. He wants you to live in that abundance. But the question is, will you dare to pray for that abundance? Will you dare to pray that God would reveal to you and to me that I, what it is that we need to roll away? Would you dare to pray that? Because when you do, God will begin to roll things away. And as you put your faith in him, you will begin to take steps forward into freedom. And you will begin to experience life abundant. Begin, listen, I began to embrace the power of Jesus in my life in those early 20s. That setback is going to be my comeback. And I tapped in and said, Lord, I am, I am yours. Put that away. I don't want any of that anymore. I began to believe in what the word of the Lord said to me. And guess what? My life has not been the same since. Because I'm walking in step with Jesus. Now, I'm going to end with this. His last words recorded during this event cannot be missed. Because this is essential. He, Lazarus, 
still had his grave clothes tightly wrapped around his hands, his feet, and his face. He is just all wrapped up, right? Jesus said to them, the people around, unwrap him and let him loose. Note, he did not unwrap himself. So find the help that you need. It's there and it's available. Let the pride and the shame and the guilt or whatever it is in your life, let it be buried. Let that be gone so that Jesus can start to bring in life and life abundant. Reach out to the leadership here. Reach out to your your, your life group leader. What needs to be rolled away in your life? What needs to be rolled away in your life? Start to believe that God will be glorified in and through you as you as he begins to do the work that only he can do. So roll it away. Begin to believe. Move when he tells you to move and come as you are and let the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit take place in your life. You know, in this passage, Jesus told Lazarus' sisters this, I am the resurrection and the life. He really is. And he will bring life to that area of your life that you think is dead. He will raise it up and it will be your comeback. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for all that you are doing and all that you have done. And Father, I know there are people out there right now who need their setbacks, need those areas of life to be their comebacks. And I pray, God, right now that you would do a miraculous work right where they are and raise it up, waken it back up in them, allow their pride to be dead, allow the shame to go away and the guilt that they may carry. Let, Let them set it down, let it be rolled away. And God, I pray that you right now would bring life abundantly I pray that we would dare to pray for that abundant life. God, reveal to us what it it means to be a husband or a wife living in abundance, a father or a mother, a son or a daughter. And God, I pray for those people right now out there who may be watching and they're saying, look, I, I need to, I, my spirit, I need to be raised from the dead. I'm walking in my sin. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. God, right now, God, I pray that they would embrace you and they would put their faith in you. God, that they would simply cry out this prayer, Lord, save me from my sin. Forgive me of my sin. I am dead in my sins. I am dead in these things that keep me from walking with you. Forgive me. Come into my life, Lord. They would pray that they put their faith in you as the son of God, that you came and you died and you rose that third day that they would simply say, Lord, save me. Come into my life. I want to follow you. And Lord, I pray that this week we begin to examine those areas of our life that we need to walk in abundance, that we need to be raised back to life. Thank you, Jesus, for this time that we've had. May you be honored. May you be glorified. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.